It's Friday night in the A, and you know what that means. Kelly Price and Tori McElhaney coming at you on Rise Up Tonight. Presented by AT&T. I know it's Halloween, and that's just around the corner, and it's spooky season, right. but man, the Falcons just really ran into a buzzsaw this week. Injuries are no excuse, and Joe Burrow very well may be him, but that was a tough one. Yeah, it's really hard to look at this game and not feel like you just want to wash it and move on to the next one. There is some thing, There are some things to learn from it, but at the end of the day, it is tough to go back to. You're lucky it only counts as one, as Arthur Smith said, after the game. But the defending NFC AFC champions looked exactly like that in this one. Let's huddle up about it. Let's huddle up with Kelly and Tori on the world of Falcons football. It was the third game this season that Atlanta fell behind by 21 or more points. Burrow completed 19, 19 of his first 21 passes for 325 yards before the first half even ended. But worse than the slow start, I think, was the fact that the Falcons didn't have a moment that they rallied from, like we've seen in some of these other games in which they've mounted comebacks. Why do you think that is? I'm actually really glad, glad that you brought this up because I thought that moment was coming at the start of the third quarter, actually. If you, the Falcons put together a very long productive drive coming out of halftime it feels like a different game that half what happened instead is that they go three and out worse the defense gets a stop right after giving the ball right back to the offense but then the offense again goes three and out if there was a moment I think had the potential of what you're referring to it was this moment specifically yeah you got to capitalize on those moments and when you get behind by that much that early you got to be able to turn to the passing game to dig you out as well Falcons just said no we're not doing that. I'll just say it. You're not going to win a lot of games in the NFL, especially a shootout with Joe Burrow with 13 pass attempts. From the outside looking in, it feels like the fear or inability or lack of confidence in airing it out is kind of holding this offense back. What are the Falcons saying about this from the inside, Tori? Yeah, so Arthur Smith was point blank asked if he trusts Marcus Mariota, and he said without hesitation that yes, yes he does. And what I will say is that it's not like the Falcons were refusing to pass the ball late against the Bengals. That's a fallacy. If you look at the 18 total plays they had as an offense in the second half, 13 of those plays look to be originally designed as pass plays. It's not about the Falcons not going to the pass. It's about the lack of production and execution when they do go to it. And that's what they really have to figure out going forward. So the Bengals had four receivers with at least 25 yards after catch. The 481 passing yards allowed are the most this season by the Falcons allowed. And by the way, we're very close to the franchise high passing yards given up in 2004, which was 499. Ooh. Injuries are a factor here for sure, but how can Atlanta tighten up its coverage going forward with the guys that they've got? Yeah, this is something that defensive players have talked a lot about. They talked about tightening, tightening up the zones and tackling better. But I really liked what Dean Pease said on Thursday, which was that yes, they need to tackle better and they gave up too many explosives. They were pretty good at both prior to the Cincinnati game. So it's all about the yards after catch explosives and not getting beat deep. Well, we've talked a lot about Joe Burrow and he certainly had some viral pregame outfits, but the Falcons made some solid fashion cho choices of their own in Paycor Stadium tunnels this week. We're walking in presented by Wells Fargo. Let's start with Alameda Zakia serving a vest moment, serving some OZ ice up top, serving some really <laughs> nice sneakers that I don't know what the designer is, but I really like them. So I would like to go on the record that I saw this picture and immediately told Kelly that we <laughs> need to have OZ on this week. I just love a puffy vest. I may or may not, I'll say this, I may or may not have just bought myself one because <laughs> of this look. I love it. Well, this is officially a segment sponsored by vests and dope jackets because here's a <laughs> Abdulla Anderson bringing us some fall vibes with the flannel jacket. I love it. This look to me, I think you're exactly right, just screams fall. I mean, you have the color and the flannel. Tis fall. I love it. I love it. Great <laughs> choice. Another fun jacket, Avery Williams rocking a street artsy kind of pattern on his puffer jacket. It kind of reminds me of our friend Greg Mike's style, uh, but the chef's kiss moment of this fit for me is the duffel bag that kind of matches with a similar cartoony art print. I love how he really let those pieces shine with the all black. This is such a difficult jacket to style because it is so loud and so fun and so crazy, but I agree that Avery did a good job of letting the jacket speak for itself. And all I'll say this, this may be a hot take, but this Ooh. is one, one of my favorite looks Ooh. of the season. Ooh, 
Ooh, I love it. <laughs> we can always count on our boy Young Wei Koo for an impeccable suit as well. He ate and left no crumbs here. He may have worn this gray number before, but it's a classic. You can't go wrong with it, right? Like you said, a classic. It's clean and it's classy, and that goes a long way here. Reliable, just like Mr. Koo himself. Mm -hmm. All right, we have to hit you with a little bonus here. The head coach himself having a moment in this red blazer, looking sharp, Arthur Smith. Applause, applause, applause. Standing ovation for the man in charge himself making his Falcon Spitz debut. <laughs> um, I mean, we did say that this was the week of fun jackets, and the subtle red is quite fun. I love it. It's a great look. Hard to believe that Halloween is just a few days away. Take this as your reminder to grab some fun size candy bars at the there store for those trick or treaters on Monday. That being said, we asked the Falcons what their favorite Halloween candies are in our question of the week. Reese's. Reese's? Reese's. About Classic five. or pieces? Not pieces. Mm. Okay. Regular two cups. Yeah. We're two regular two Reese's cups. I used to like the little candy corn, but now that I got older, I really don't like it too much. But definitely it was candy corn. Reese's for sure. Still to this day. No, I ain't never get to have the full size boy, but <laughs> I had my little cups, you know what yeah, I mean? Okay. Or my little eggs, but I, I was fortunate to get some full size later on. Ooh, candy corn. Candy corn, oh, that's controversial. A lot of people don't like candy corn. No, I, got, I like that candy you corn. You like candy yeah. corn? <laughs> Maybe like sour punch straws, or something, the little mini packs. Cause I'm not a chocolate mm. guy. Dots. Dots? Still my favorite candy, you know, so. Definitely, you know, my brother, whenever he had the, the small pack of dots at the bottom of the bag, I'd always ask to trade for him. So. Yeah. All right, we'll get to that in a second. Yeah. But Richie Grant brings up a very interesting point. Which Reese's are the best? You mm. mentioned the eggs. I agree. The Christmas trees, the pumpkins, all the shaped Reese's are goaded. And what's your favorite candy? So uh, there are categories to this, right? Of course. So for sweet candies, uh, it's peanut M&M's, classic. Yes. For sour candies, I have three words for you. Sour gummy worms. It's both solid choices. <laughs> I also would have loved to be Avery Williams' brother that he's trading these dots with. I mean, no one wants the dots, but Avery Williams apparently did. I am so confused by <laughs> the dots and the candy corn takes of this team. Yes. I, I don't like either and I'm very surprised because I feel like not a lot of people do. No and I think Rashawn Evans was surprised that I said hey that's a controversial take. He was like no is. I love candy corn. Good for you man. Good hey, for you. You love what you love I guess. All right well this Sunday the Falcons will induct a 12th man into their ring of honor. Longtime Falcon center Todd McClure told us he's excited and maybe a little nervous for the honor. We'll talk with him later in the show. Plus the the Falcons rookies make their annual Halloween trip to Children's Hospital of Atlanta in costume. That story is coming up next on Rise Up Tonight. Rise Up Tonight is presented by AT&T and brought to you by Georgia Lottery. Today could be the day. By Home Depot, how doers get more done. By Mercedes-Benz, the best of nothing. And by Truist, committed to a better future. It's the Halloween holiday season, and that calls for some time-tested traditions. And the Falcons rookies continued a heartwarming team tradition this week as we rise up for Atlanta, brought to you by Truist. Every Halloween, the Falcons rookies dress up in Halloween costumes and spend playtime with patients at Children's Hospital of Atlanta. They continued this tradition even virtually through COVID, and we're back to doing it face-to-face -face this week. The costumes they wear always crack me up. I mean, the Cheetos and Justin Schaefer there, that's a fantastic <laughs> costume. Come on. They say it was a great way to spend their off day. It makes me feel good. Uh, honestly, I'm a... I'm a people person myself, so just getting to hang out with people, or hang out with kids, making their day better. You know, I mean, it brings me some sort of sense of joy to know that I'm making some, someone else's day better. It's great, you know, it's, it's a great boost. It's for these kids and you walk the halls and you see what they're going through and, um, you know, it puts in perspective everything that you're going through. And um, if you can take that, take that away, that, that pain away for one day for them, then it's, it's definitely worth it. And, you know, it's something that I, I want to do more of and I think that we'll continue to do as a team. So I don't know if you guys saw the flash, him yes. running by. That's Josh Ali, and apparently he stayed in costume the whole time, was super serious about being the flash and, and you know, obviously running around. I love their all of their costumes. Yes. They look great. I'm really proud of them for all all the effort that they went into doing that. Yeah, That's there really was, great. There was a hot dog, there was Cheetos, there were there was everything. <laughs> sweet stuff there. And you know what else is pretty sweet? The next couple games for the Falcons are extremely winnable. Right. You got the Panthers twice, the Chargers, the Bears, the Commanders, and don't forget that these three and four Falcons are still 
still tied for first place in the NFC South. Mm -hmm. Arthur Smith said this week that's a good reminder to just not give up, basically. And they're going to be getting into their game preparation here a little bit more jacked up, right? Yeah, no, you're exactly right. And I, it's something that Arthur Smith actually was very honest about on Monday. He, he said he was like, I was actually a little annoyed, and I will say that's his words, not mine, <laughs> by the focus that he felt this team lack after the 49ers win. I expect that to be very different this week as the Falcons move forward because you can almost use this Bengals loss as a wake-up call. And with this part of the schedule coming up, there are some on paper winnable games for the Falcons, and they could use a few decisive wins. Yeah, I think that would do worlds for the morale of this team. That being said, we've got some thoughts on it. Our hot takes are still to come, coming up. And the mud duck himself, Todd McClure, joins us in the nest, coming up next on Rise Up Tonight. Rise Up Tonight is presented by AT&T and brought to you by Georgia Lottery. Today could be the day. By Home Depot, how doers get more done. By Mercedes-Benz, the best of nothing. And by Truist, committed to a better future. Welcome back to Rise Up Tonight. Let's head in the nest with Kelly, Tori, and this week's special guest. Brought to you by Mercedes-Benz. We're so excited to have Todd McClure join us in the nest today. You are becoming the 12th member of the Falcons Ring of Honor this weekend during halftime. Are you nervous? Are you excited? What's kind of the vibe or the feelings that you're having ahead of this big moment for you? A, a little bit of everything. Nerves. I'm excited. Excited to see a lot of my ex-teammates. Uh, you know, and it's a big moment. I'm nervous. Uh, I've been watching Roddy White's speech and everything he talked about and kind of jotting some things down. Uh, it, it's a big moment. And to be able to have my, my teammates, uh, you know, the Falcons organization and my family there, it's going to be an awesome day. Now, I remember when you were brought in over the summer and they told you about this this honor. I that was one of my favorite moments of, of this off season. For you, what was that day like when, when they told you the news and having some of those guys around you to, to share that with you? It was really neat because uh, having Justin Blaylock and Tyson Claybo, two of my, my favorite teammates uh, ever, guys that I spent a lot of time with, uh, for them to be there, uh, to share the news with me, it was it was emotional. Uh, we had a lot of great memories, a lot of bad memories together, but we went through it together, and I have those guys there it meant a lot to me. We had you on this show back when Harry Douglas was my co-host, which obviously that was a lot of fun to discuss some of your kind of memories with him. Um, we talked about the name Mud Duck and kind of where that came from, but for any new viewers and for Tori, can you share with us again the story of how Mud Duck came to be? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So Coach Al Miller was our strength coach. He was uh, under Coach Dan Reed's staff. He gave everybody a nickname. Uh, Tyson Claybo was Big Bear. Uh, Mud Duck was my name. I don't know where he got it from. I got a little bit of a waddle when I walk, so maybe that's what it what it came from. But it stuck, and you know, I have people today that don't call me by my first name. They call me by Mud Duck. <laughs> That's fantastic. Oh, I love it. Now, we we are a Falcon show, and we have to talk about the 2022 Falcons. I mean, for you, when you're watching kind of the transformation that this offensive line has had from last year to this year, I mean, what are just your overall thoughts of what that group has been able to do in 2022? Those guys have been awesome. It's, it's definitely been fun to watch. And I think going into this season, there were a lot of people skeptical of this team in general. You know, didn't know what type of season we would have and that we might be rebuilding. And I think they've come out and, uh, you know, they shocked me. And I think they've shocked a lot of Falcons fans the way they responded. And uh, for Cordell Patterson to go out, you know, I know that was a big blow for us because he was a big part of that offense. But those guys are, everybody's stepping up. You know, they came up a little short this past weekend, but I like the way this team's headed. That being said, with Arthur Smith as the head coach, very, you know, run heavy, run first kind of guy, former offensive lineman himself. What's kind of your thoughts on maybe Arthur Smith and maybe interactions you had with him when you were in town for training camp or just kind of overall thoughts on what he's been doing? Yeah, absolutely. You said it. You know, he's my type of guy, has an offensive line background and uh, loves to run the football. And I think anytime you can establish a run in the National Football League, uh, it helps out often. It helps your whole team out. 
Uh, love Coach Smith. Uh, only had an opportunity to talk to him a couple times, but I love everything he's about. Now, you're also a part of uh, SEC Football Legends class this year. What does that honor mean to you on top of the Falcons honor, but, but this one as well? Yeah, it's huge. I, I, mean, I just got an email from the SEC office, and they're like, you hadn't sent your stuff in. I'm, and I said, I'm kind of overloaded right now, going to uh, you know Atlanta this weekend. That's another huge honor. You look at all the guys that have come uh, from the SEC that have played college football, and uh, it's huge. You know, growing up as a kid, looking back, and I never would have dreamed that one of these things would happen, let alone two in the same year. So uh, I'm humbled and definitely honored for both of these achievements. I wanted to get your thoughts on just kind of the college football landscape right now. Lots of things going on with LSU football. Obviously, big win for them last week. Brian Kelly coming in there. What are your thoughts on what LSU is doing? Yeah, they're, they're doing great. The way they started, I think, you know, a lot of guys, and I think it's just common in, in college football now with the transfer portal, you have a different team every year, you know, and it's trying to gel as quick as possible. Uh, they went out that first day, played Florida State, and, you know, missed an extra point there. But if they if they get that, get back into that game, we're looking, I saw some yesterday, they may be a top five team right now. Uh, you know, the fans here in, in Tiger country are pretty harsh. Uh, you know, they, they love you one day, hate you the next. Right now, uh, I think this group, Coach Kelly and his team is starting to gel a little bit. Yeah, and then, you know, you've mentioned the uh, speech that you're writing for this weekend. I wanted to maybe see if you could give us a little preview, what you're thinking about. I don't know if you're talking about maybe how much Atlanta means to you and that kind of stuff, but what are some thoughts that are kind of going through your head as you're trying to gather those thoughts together? You know, just uh, a lot about my family that that helped raise me and get me to this. You know, a lot of thanks to uh, Mr. Blank, the Falcons organization, and um, just with those names, the other 11 guys that are in this ring of honor. It's it's, uh, it's some high, high high names, guys that have meant a lot to me, guys that I've looked up to uh, during my time in Atlanta, and to be mentioned in those names is just uh, you know I got to pinch myself. I don't believe it. Well, it'll be happening on Sunday regardless. We're all excited to see that big moment for you. A big 13-year career here. A lot of people still love Mud Duck around these parts. So thanks so much for joining us. We really appreciate the time. Uh, and we'll be right back on Rise Up tonight. Thank y'all. Hey, Atlanta. This is Head Crack talking. And you're watching Rise Up Tonight, presented by AT&T. It's like I don't get caught up in whatever narrative is after four weeks of the daily narratives. You can almost write some of these narratives and live and die every week by the narratives because it sets up bad, you know, narratives. So you can frame the narrative, you can write narratives. So those are easy narratives. And Not a good week for the narratives that we pushed last week. Sorry, <laughs> Coach, about that one. You recycled a hot take last week. I think I'm going to do that this week. Yeah, uh, I hope yours is better than mine. <laughs> <laughs> we do like recycling around these parts. Well, we know this is a run-first offense, and as we saw last week, maybe to a fault. But that's still a solid game plan for this Sunday when the Falcons meet a middle-of-the-pack run defense. Don't forget the Falcons still own the league's fourth-best rushing attack. Like we talked about last week, this offense is able to find success when it establishes itself on the ground first. I think if they start there with their roots, they're able to be more balanced overall, finding themselves in better situations like no third and longs, not being down by double digits, all that kind of stuff. It's a lukewarm take, but it's my two cents this week. Lukewarm, but still important. And <laughs> for my hot take, look, we saw the secondary get tore up by Joe Burrow and the Bengals last week, but I do think we'll see them play better collectively as a group this week. Though you're still without some key starters, this group has now had a whole week of prep together, which they couldn't say they had last week, knowing that their depth will be tested but the test isn't as significant pj walker is not joe burrow and right. there will be no jamar chase tyler board or, or t higgins running around on this sunday i'm not saying the secondary is going to be at full strength because they're not but i do think that they will look and play a little bit better so it wasn't some kind of dream the panthers who have embraced the tank in a sense did beat tom brady in the bucks last week arthur smith talked about hey that's a nice reminder we're all in the same league here yeah arthur smith said that yeah this is you, you you don't want to have that type of reminder, but sometimes it's good to have. Yeah, anybody can win on any given Sunday, as they say. Well, that'll do it for us. Thanks for staying up late here on Rise Up Tonight. For Tori McElhaney, I'm Kelly Price. We'll see you back here again next Friday night.